Soon after creation, our first parents rebelled against God and disobeyed God, uh, an event we often refer to as the fall into sin. And God immediately, right away, says to our first parents, as he speaks to Satan, they hear the promise that he's going to be sending a savior, that uh, a promised one is coming who will defeat the work of the devil, will be the seed of Eve, so it'll be a human being. At the same time, uh, he will be God, powerful enough to defeat the work of the devil. Even though our first parents didn't know yet that his name would be Jesus, they didn't know that he'd be born in Bethlehem, they believed God's promise. They believed that there was a Savior coming, often referred to as the Messiah in the Old Testament. And so those who believed in that promise were really the first Christians, even though Jesus Christ would not come into history for thousands of years. For the sake of our illustration, Let's pretend that that promise from God was hidden inside of this gray box, okay? And those who were worshiping God through that promise and were looking forward to the Savior coming, think of them as, you might say, worshiping God through that box and everything that it contains about the promised Savior. And so even though Jesus had not arrived yet in history, those first people, and that got passed on through the generations, those first people who were believing in that promise and that orally transmitted word of God, they were the first Christians as they were looking forward to the arrival of the Messiah someday in history. As we go through time, people taught this to their children. Parents and grandparents, great-grandparents spoke to their children and told them about the coming Savior. And that's how the message about the coming Christ was passed on from generation to generation. God finally establishes the family line through whom the Messiah would come. And that is the family of Abraham. God promises Abraham that this coming Savior would be one of his ancestors down the road. And so at that the mark that God gave to Abraham and to his family was the mark of circumcision on the male children. That was sort of God's way of marking his church who was believing and trusting in this promise of the coming Savior. And so that continues to go through time with that promise. And those children of Abraham now are carrying with them this wonderful teaching about the coming Savior. As we continue to move through time, once we get to the time of Moses and when the children of Israel were in slavery in Egypt, God begins to lay out various rules and laws. We call them ceremonial laws that have to do with this coming Savior. And many of these laws had to do with uh, the food they were to eat, some of the festivals they were supposed to uh, keep and, re and reenact every year, such as the Passover, uh, the Sabbath laws. There were certain laws about the seventh day of the week. Many of these laws... Uh, were the ways that God then had people continue to worship and embrace this coming Savior. So we call those the ceremonial laws. St. Paul uses the expression that all of these ceremonial laws were a foreshadowing of the coming Christ. Something that was going to happen in the future when Jesus would die on the cross was foreshadowed. That means there was like a shadow of it through all of these ceremonial laws that God had given in the Old Testament. As we continue to move through history, God gives more and more prophecies. He kind of tightens the focus of, of the coming Messiah, where he would be born. He starts to talk about his crucifixion and gives details about how Jesus would die and where he would be buried. And we see that reflected in some of David's Psalms. And then as we move along through, for instance, the prophet Isaiah, and on up closer to the time of the arrival of the Messiah. When God decided that the time had finally come for Jesus Christ to be born into the world, we're told, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. So God suddenly reveals who this Savior now is. No longer... Do we just have the promise of Christ coming? Now we have the actual Savior himself who has arrived in history at the birth of Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus then, of course, goes to the cross to pay for all of our sins and to be that very Savior for us. Now, suddenly, that Old Testament ceremonial law had no value and no purpose anymore. Just like this box that is now empty of that promise. No longer using those rules and rituals will value anybody, will help anybody, because they're now empty of those promises. The reality, St. Paul says, is now in Christ. The reality of our salvation has now come with Jesus Christ. So the night before Jesus goes to the cross, he gives a brand new covenant, a new testament to his church, a new agreement from God to his people. No longer would that old covenant and the ceremonial law have any value now that he has arrived. And so Jesus now gives a new covenant, the Lord's Supper, his very body and blood, because he was the Passover lamb that came to be sacrificed for us. So Christians now in the New Testament church, as they did in the early church, worship the Christ who has come. No longer do we have to rely on those Old Testament ceremonial laws that were holding Christ for us. Now Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And so those who are in the New Testament church uh, worship Christ through the ways he has given us, through baptism, through his word, through the Lord's Supper, and through the, the gift of the office of the keys by which our sins are forgiven.